So give us 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, and I'll start now. Good morning and welcome to the Deacon Science and Society Network Healthy Future Seminar today. My name is Dr. Neera Bhatia. I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Law at Deakin. A little bit about the Science and Society Network to begin with. The Science and Society Network was formed in 2018 in recognition that scientists and humanities and social science researchers need to work together to meet the great challenges of this century. No single academic field can bring about the changes we need to see in the world. Bridging disciplinary divides is the key to finding new solutions to the problems we face today. The Science and Society Network supports early and mid-career researchers across the university who are embarking on groundbreaking interdisciplinary projects. Before we begin the seminar today, I would like to begin by acknowledging my, and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which each of us are today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For those of you who have not attended one of our seminars today, here's a quick rundown on the structure of today's event. I will shortly introduce our speaker, Professor Ian Freckleton, AOQC. Ian will present for 30 to 40 minutes and then we will have some discussion and comments and perspectives from Associate Professor Marie Bismarck and Dr. Rebecca McWhorter, who I will introduce a little bit later in the seminar. We will then throw to questions and discussion and Q&A from you, our audience. I will be chairing a discussion today here on Zoom and my colleague Giles Campbell-Wright will be moderating the YouTube live chat. Now we're keen to hear from you and to answer your questions because that's really important to this seminar. It makes this seminar. So you can either post your questions into the YouTube chat or you can send your questions on Twitter at SSN Deacon and make sure you use the hashtags, hashtag SSN Seminar or hashtag Healthy Futures. Okay, now into the really interesting part of the seminar. I'm going to now introduce our speaker. Professor Ian Freckleton is quite an, an impressive speaker and uh, for many won't really need an introduction. But for those of you that don't know Ian Freckleton, Ian Freckleton is a Queen's Council in full-time practice as a barrister throughout Australia. He's also a judge of the Supreme Court of Nauru and a professorial fellow of law and psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. He's a member of the Victorian Bar Council and of the Coronial Council of Victoria and has been commissioner at the Victorian Law Reform Commission, a president of the Australian and New Zealand Association of Psychiatry, Psychology and Law, and a member of many statutory tribunals. He's a member of the Victorian Bar Council and Coronial Council of Victoria. Professor Freckleton is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, the Australian Academy of the Social Sciences and the Australasian College of Legal Medicine. In addition to all of these impressive um, uh, bodies, Professor Freckleton is also uh, the editor of the Journal of Law and Medicine and the founder editor of the Psychiatry, Psychology and Law Journal. He's the author of more than 40 books and over 600 articles and chapters of books. More recently, in June of this year, in 2021, Professor Freckleton was appointed an officer, AO, of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to the Law and to the Legal Profession across fields including health, medicine and technology. No doubt, um, we are all very, very interested to hear Professor Freckleton's presentation today on social media uh, and the contemporary health practitioner. 
We welcome you in and we very much look forward to your presentation. So if you'd like to uh, share your slides and begin your presentation, that would be great. Thank you very much, Nira, for the generous introduction. I hope that's working, so let me know if it is. Very much indeed. Good. Good to go. Good. Well, very nice to be speaking to everyone. I'm sorry I'm not in your physical presence and that I function as the uh, lockdown entertainment uh, of the early part of the day, but nonetheless, it's a great privilege to be speaking to you. Uh, I also uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of the custodians of the land on which we are respectively present. I'm going to talk to you about something which I hope is very contemporary and which people will find of particular interest because all of us utilize the internet and most of us utilize social media for a whole variety of different purposes. Patients uh, use the internet to evaluate whom they want to consult as a health practitioner, to research what might be their diagnosis, their treatment, prognoses that uh, perhaps they, uh, they might have. They give feedback on uh, their treaters. They communicate generally with, uh, uh, with others about their experiences as patients. And health practitioners in some ways do the, uh, the complementary. They, they research and uh, communicate with uh, colleagues about how they should handle cases. They need to promote their practices and they do so these days in a variety of ways including utilizing social media. They look up their patients from time to time to understand a little better about, uh, about who they are. And uh, afterwards, they, uh, they communicate sometimes with, uh, with colleagues. But all of us have in common that uh, as members of the general community, we have an online presence. And that, uh, that online presence tells a lot about us in all sorts of ways, some of them we're comfortable with, some of them, uh, it's an involuntary kind of profiling that takes place. But it's more and more important, of course, important for uh, uh, advertisers, for promoters, but it's important for all of us in our reciprocal relationships one with another. And those online footprints uh, that arise from what we have posted and what has been posted about us make each one of us distinctive, if you like. It's like a, uh, a fingerprint uh, in the new era. And those footprints uh, are not only identifying and individualizing, but they have a value for us as individuals in a social sense, in a professional sense, and in a commercial sense as well. And uh, that's what I'd like to reflect upon with you today in terms of the health practitioner patient relationship, because that relationship has been evolving for some considerable time, of course. Uh, technology changes, cases evolve, rapprochements are made between the law and health professions. And as those professions change as clinical practice uh, becomes different, so too do the relationships alter and need to be regulated in different ways by the law and the legal system. And that's what I'd like to explore with you today. And I'm going to do it by reference to a variety of interesting and very contemporary cases. One of them just uh, decided a few days ago to think through with you what is taking place in terms of the relationship, whether the law is getting it right, whether regulators are doing the kinds of interventions that we need and expect them to do in relation to what health practitioners uh, say and how they intersect with the world uh, through social media. So let me talk a little bit about review websites. They exist in relation to all health practitioners. I'm going to concentrate on doctors and to a lesser degree dentists. 
They're an interesting phenomenon becoming more and more significant in a, uh, a, a, a professional sense all the time. The positive side of them is that they facilitate consumer decision-making in an informed way and therefore choice, enabling a perspective on the quality and nature of services provided by practitioners. Because each one of us, when we see a health practitioner, has particular expectations and preferences about the kind of person we want and the approach that we aspire to their taking. That's the positive side. But the negative side is that these websites can be a forum for dysregulated and even retributive ventilation of what people feel like saying at any given time. We talk and we laugh about keyboard warriors who are much braver online than they are in person. Um, But it's a reality that some persons uh, are minded to express their aggrievement with the individual, with the world in a disinhibited way online. And that is when one finds people espousing angry, disappointed and distressed ruminations uh, through their keyboards. And there can be all manner of reasons for that. This can be the product of personality disorders, mental illness, malice, just temporary anger and uh, a preparedness to say things in an unregulated way because it feels like a good thing to do at the time. And alcohol and drugs can even play a role as well. So let me take you to, uh, to a handful of, uh, of cases where, if you like, health practitioners have struck back at this phenomenon when it's been Uh, unreasonably uh, expressed. And first of all, let me talk to you about Dr. Al Muderis, who uh, is a very high profile uh, orthopedic surgeon, came originally from um, Iraq. And you might have read uh, uh, some of his books, which are very entertaining and and quite gripping, in fact, about uh, the circumstances in which he left his home country, came to Australia, and has developed a high profile uh, practice utilizing prosthetic techniques, which are quite revolutionary. He became the subject of a campaign of denigration and uh, 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 via YouTube and Facebook from a patient who was vilifying him, claiming he'd been unethically mutilated uh, by uh, Dr. Al Muderis and that Dr. Al Muderis was utterly incompetent and dangerous. The, uh, the publications from this patient got to the point of threatening to kill Dr. Al Muderis and a variety of threats to his wife and children were also made. Ultimately, Dr. Almuderis decided to sue for defamation. And this was the the first of this modern era of cases for uh, responsive litigation in respect of online uh, actions by patients. Uh, No doubt it was not a straightforward decision to make because there's a risk that when such actions are taken, they make the perpetrator of such uh, critiques a martyr and can prompt them to even more vehement and retributive postings. At any rate, uh, the case went before the New South Wales uh, Supreme Court. I won't go into the details of it, but it was found that the publications were manifestly defamatory, they were untrue, and uh, damages of uh, $320,000 plus another $160,000 for aggravated damages Uh, were ordered by the Supreme Court judge and injunctions were issued to try to inhibit further publication on the internet by the patient. So this can genuinely be regarded as a a groundbreaking decision in terms of, again, the relationship between health practitioners and their patients and the preparedness of a health practitioner to avail themselves of the remedies of the law in order to try to stop the process of unpleasantness from former patient uh, and to uh, try to inhibit a a campaign of uh, of defamatory uh, postings on online sites. It was one of a series of cases and uh, there was another one involving a, 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 a fight doctor but I'm going to pass by that one and take you to another one in 2019 
uh, again, in, in, that was uh, transacted before the Supreme Court of New South Wales, case of Tavakoli and Imacides. Uh, Dr. Tavakoli was a, an Iran-born plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and a, uh, a patient and her husband uh, gave Google reviews uh, in respect of Dr. Tavakoli, asserting a range of uh, adverse uh, things about his professional skills, alleging incompetence, performance of a, a procedure which miscarried according to the reviews, and uh, allegations again of cruelty and, uh, and bullying. Court endeavoured to inhibit the, uh, the publications, but to little avail. Further publications ensued from the husband. And uh, uh, that caused the court, one, to find that Dr. Tavakoli had been the subject of defam defamatory postings, then to reflect on how to measure the appropriate damages. And that involved it looking to the numbers of visitors to his website in an effort to try to evaluate the impact of what had been posted upon his business reputation and upon the preparedness of patients to submit to his professional ministrations. Again, aggravated damages were awarded and the damages in total were some 530,000. So uh, relatively similar. I think the previous one in relation to Dr. Al Muderis was some 480,000. So we're, we're looking at a kind of half million dollar figure to, uh, going halfway between the uh, two decisions. Let me now just refer you to a case determined uh, a few days ago, Dean and Puleo. It was a decision from the, uh, uh, this time, the County Court of Victoria. And it arose out of four Google reviews again uh, this time in respect of a uh, periodontist. The person who did it termed themselves Cat, and they accused Dr. Uh, Dean of uh, being unprofessional, undermining, failing to diagnose illnesses, making suggestions that were unreasonable, overcharging, lying, bullying, berating, etc. Uh, she was given a one-star rating for the beautiful worldly consulting room only. So uh, clearly hurtful, damaging review. Now, the, uh, the, the judge in this case was encouraged to go further in understanding Dr. Dean's practice. And the evidence adduced was that she had about 45 dentists who referred to her. Uh, I think actually, I beg your pardon, I think maybe 450. Uh, 800 patients uh, a year. And uh, altogether, her practice had about 1,600 patients. And the practice depended significantly upon a website that she ran. And the expert evidence adduced again in the case, and I think this is interesting in terms of contemporary uh, health practice, uh, was that Google reviews are looked at by most patients. Dr. Dean claimed that she uh, had sustained immeasurable damage to her emotional well-being, her psychological and physical health, her reputation, her work, and her business. So as you can see, it was a, a, a claim in respect of her feelings as well as uh, in terms of uh, the outcome that it had financially. The evidence was that uh, the uh, defamatory postings had been seen by more than 100,000 people. Do you get as a salutary reminder about postings on the net? One uh, can be tempted to, uh, to put something on Facebook or on LinkedIn or whatever in the middle of the night when cross or frustrated about something, uh, not being aware of just how many people are likely to see it. And uh, the, uh, Judge Clayton in this case uh, talked in terms of a concept well known in defamation law, the grapevine effect, which refers to the fact that many more people tend to see publications uh, than uh, those who, or, or learn of them, than those who directly can be established as having viewed an, uh, a posting. In this instance, damages of $170,000 were awarded and indemnity costs, which means all the costs that were actually incurred by Dr. Dean in bringing the litigation, and they would have been substantial indeed. So that's a, a combination of, uh, of just recent cases to give a flavor of a new phenomenon of health practitioners availing themselves of the law. Now, uh, 
often enough, and you saw it in relation to CAT, uh, reviewers hide behind pseudonyms. Uh, so it's not immediately apparent to the practitioner who they are and wh what they can do in terms of having any kind of a constructive discussion with the individual about whatever it is that has upset them. Uh, a significant decision uh, was made in the Federal Court of Australia last year in respect of a dentist uh, who, like many others, um, relies on the internet to attract patients. Uh, in the judgment, interestingly, I thought uh, they were termed customers. At any rate, Justice Murphy was persuaded ultimately to make orders to compel Google to provide preliminary discovery. And that's a discovery before the issuing of a statement of claim in order to enable the prospective plaintiff to enable who it should be uh, that should be named as the defendant. In this case, Justice Murphy ordered Google to disgorge all material that was identifying of who it was who had been posting the online reviews that aggrieved the doctor in this case. So a very significant development because it meant that the veil of secrecy for the reviewer was removed and the capacity of the uh, uh, health practitioner who'd been the subject of the anonymous reviews uh, was uncovered, enabling uh, uh, litigation to take place. The decision's been followed in, uh, in a case involving the high profile gangland solicitor, not that she's part of a gangland, but she takes gangland cases, Sarah Gard Wilson against Google. And uh, believe it or not, even a brothel that uh, calls itself the boardroom of Melbourne uh, that received an adverse review from a dissatisfied client and wanted to, uh, to take action to protect its commercial reputation. And uh, again, the, uh, the uh, decision of Justice Murphy in Cabbage and Google uh, was invoked. So the reason I mention uh, what would otherwise be an uninteresting uh, interlocutory procedural decision in federal court is that you can see that it goes to the heart of enabling health practitioners and others uh, to ascertain the identity of those who have posted potentially defamatory online comments or reviews about them. And this gives a fillip to the potential for health practitioners to take action if they feel themselves the subject of unreasonable, unfair, uh, defamatory postings by patients. This is a phenomenon that one could not have conceived of uh, a decade ago, and such actions against patients were all but unknown until these very last few years um, in respect of reviews especially on the internet. Let me go to the other side of the coin now to think about the impact of social media on the relationship between health practitioners and their patients. We all have a right to post on social media and talk about what we think. And it's a positive thing that enables us to have interesting discourse and lively and entertaining interaction uh, with persons about our lives and our experiences. But it raises issues, doesn't it? When it is health practitioners who are engaging in this kind of activity. It's not entirely an issue related to health practitioners either. It applies to lawyers and all manner of other people besides. When does one stop being whoever one is? And when does one's conduct impact upon the reputation of and standing of one's profession? It used to be that when one came off shift or left the office or chambers or rooms, that was it. A person could live their life separately unless they did something truly extraordinary. But as we'll see in a handful of cases to which I'll direct your attention, that situation is changing. APRA, the regulator of the 15 regulated health practitioners, uh, professions, I think, has issued a uh, communication 
a little over 18 months ago entitled Social Media, How to Meet Your Obligations Under the National Law. It, it's a useful, uh, unaffected uh, uh, publication endeavouring to give guidance, uh, reminding health practitioners of the need to comply with confidentiality and privacy obligations, maintain professional boundaries, be respectful and professional in communications about others and not present information which is false, misleading or deceptive. It, it points out that inappropriate use of social media can result in a variety of harms and uh, including uh, breaches of confidentiality, defamation of colleagues or employers, violation of boundaries, unintended exposure of personal information. And uh, they emphasize that, of course, this information stays on social media indefinitely. And once it is in cyberspace, it can be very difficult to retrieve it or change it. APRA has exhorted practitioners uh, to uh, be careful about the reality that the fact that a person posting is a health practitioner can relatively easily be ascertained by persons reading the posting by a few keystrokes, so often and readily uh, the case. Again, a salutary reminder uh, for, for all of us, given the extent of that digital footprint to which I referred earlier in the discussion. And uh, they exhorted practitioners to be aware of and careful in how they establish the relevant security and privacy settings. In respect of doctors, uh, Good Medical Practice is a publication from the Medical Board of Australia, which identifies in a, in a broad sense the kinds of professional values and expectations uh, that exist in respect of how doctors comport themselves. It affirms that doctors have a, a right to have their own personal views and values and to express them, but it reminds medical practitioners that, that they have an obligation to consider the effect of anything they say publicly, anything they do outside work, including online, that might impact upon the reputation and standing of their profession. And there are quite extensive references to the kinds of values which are expected of uh, medical practitioners, particularly that they be trustworthy, competent, compassionate, truthful, persons of integrity in the context of how they conduct themselves uh, as doctors. The difficulty is that a doctor doesn't stop being a doctor if it's ascertainable that they are a doctor. So uh, if, if they are out in the social world, you might remember we had one once in the era before lockdowns. Uh, the, if they behave in a way which is likely to affect people's confidence in the profession, that itself can constitute professional misconduct under the third of the definitions of professional misconduct in the national law. And more broadly, it impacts upon their suitability uh, to be persons trusted and given all the advantages that accrue by virtue of the privileges of the status of being a registered medical practitioner. Now, here's a, a left field example of a group of, uh, of uh, doctors who, uh, who went to, uh, to South America or to Central America and uh, 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 embraced a variety of weapons, uh, uh, part of a, uh, a, a, a not so sober and uh, uh, a foolish evening, probably disinhibited by the effects of alcohol. Uh, and the, uh, the, the picture uh, made its way all over the, uh, the internet, internet, resulting in the, uh, the Secretary of Health uh, of uh, Puerto Rico describing the situation as sad and exhibiting poor judgment for damages, as he put it, the beautiful effort that many others have put in place in terms of providing good medical care. So uh, an example from a little while ago, but illustrative again of the fact that some hijinks far away from home 
uh, can find themselves uh, represented internationally and the subject of uh, high level uh, condemnation, not just politically, but otherwise as well. So let me take you to three cases, uh, which are illustrative of uh, the need for uh, temperance and care by health practitioners and others in respect of their online presence. Uh, all of them you'll see are very recent. The first comes from uh, uh, T Tasmania uh, and a, uh, a Dr. Lee, who, uh, uh, yes, that is Dr. Lee uh, a, as part of his online presence because he endeavored to anonymize himself, but he didn't do it very well. A, uh, a doctor of uh, Malaysian extraction who posted some uh, really pretty obnoxious uh, sentiments uh, online that were very disrespectful to women, condoned violence and even uh, sexual uh, abuse of women. He revealed in the course of this uh, that he uh, worked in an emergency department, had gone to medical school for six years, was a fellow of the uh, Australasian College of Emergency Medicine. And uh, he referred to his own qualifications as being as genuine as the stupidity of a blogger whom he communicated with online. It wasn't too hard to work out uh, who he was ultimately. And certainly it was clear enough that he was a, uh, a medical practitioner and an emergency doctor uh, in Australia. So the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, VCAT, uh, sorry, the uh, Tasmanian uh, Health uh, Practitioner Tribunal needed to think through how to respond to the, uh, the conduct in which Dr. Lee had engaged. It found his postings to fall substantially below the standard expected of a medical practitioner. And that makes it a uh, professional um, misconduct under the, uh, the first of the categories of uh, the definition of that. And uh, they uh, noted that all of the posts when taken together made his conduct the more grave. They identified that his posts were likely to be disseminated very widely, resulting in a high risk of damage to the standing of a profession of medicine in the public eye. Commenting, some of the posts involve vulgar language expressions of committing violence and crime, all of which are inconsistent with the good repute of medical practitioners and a relationship of trust. So it goes back to good medical practice uh, between medical practitioners and patients who are of course, members of the public. So the question was what to do about it. Um, it's, it doesn't help much to be just broadly censorious of someone like this. So here's Dr. Lee. Um, uh, you can see the, uh, the mask in the, uh, the bottom left uh, posting. They reprimanded him. That was easy. That was the expression of denunciation, if you like, and suspended him for quite a short period of time and required him to undertake a, uh, a further education on ethical behaviour and communications, particularly in respect of social media. This was a, a controversial and really quite groundbreaking decision by the Tasmanian Tribunal. It was the first of its kind in this country, very much drawing a line in the sand, saying that if people behave in this not just vulgar, but truly offensive way, likely to bring discredit on their profession, there would be a, a consequence for their registration. Let me take you to another couple of, uh, of uh, comments made by the, uh, the tribunal, um, because uh, it, it very much uh, spoke in terms of the need to protect and maintain confidence in the profession and looked to the a need for sanctions to fulfill the objective of maintaining the reputation of practitioners and deter conduct that is unbecoming to a profession. The next in the sequence was a decision this time of VCAT in Victoria in respect of a, uh, of a, uh, a doctor. Uh, Dr. Koch uh, was the subject of immediate action suspending his registration in the public interest under section 156 of the national law. He'd published a variety of comments on social media in his own name that were again, demeaning slurred medical practitioners who provided uh, terminations of pregnancy, uh, doctors who treated gender dysphoria, uh, issues to do with um, persons with uh, uh, a mental health condition particularly. Uh, gender dysphoria, 
uh, they appeared to endorse or even call for violence and or genocide against persons who engaged in certain kinds of conduct. Uh, they were extremely unpleasant uh, and uh, um, hateful um, kinds of posts. The uh, tribunal found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that Dr. Cox's conduct compromises the confidence held by the public, but they can seek and receive treatment safely, not only from him, but also from other members of the profession. And they were concerned that the confidence that the community has in practitioners would be significantly undermined if he were permitted to continue to practice. But bearing in mind, this decision was coming at the relatively early juncture of immediate action prior to the matter being finally resolved substantively uh, by VCAT when the allegations inevitably of professional misconduct will need to be determined. Uh, the uh, tribunal harked back to the code of conduct to which I made reference earlier, emphasizing uh, how integral it is that practitioners uh, be trustworthy and command the respect and provide the compassion that the community expects of them. Commented, it doesn't matter if Dr. Cock finds it's amusing, it amusing, rhetorical, entertaining to engage in online antics of this nature, except that such banter may be the reality of social media posts. Dr. Cock is, however, a medical practitioner. By virtue of profession, his profession is required to abide by a code of conduct that requires respect and compassion has obligations to his profession each time he enters the playground of social media engagement. A medical practitioner cannot go online and shut to all who care to read his posts or have a misfortune coming across his posts without care as to the potential consequences of his actions. Well, you can see from the uh, very judgmental language uh, of VCAT that an adverse outcome was well and truly on the way for Dr. Koch. They, uh, they noted that they didn't hear from uh, Dr. Koch and uh, they, uh, they weren't sure whether he, the attitudes that he espoused online, as they put it, impacted or infiltrated his actual medical practice. They're mindful that they had some very good uh, um, reports of him, but they didn't consider that anything other than suspension of his registration was justified in the circumstances, commenting that his denigrating and threatening posts would remain online and probably couldn't remove them. While he apparently now, and they obviously had doubts about this, recognises that he was ill-advised to post them, there's no evidence as to how or even whether he or his clinic have reflected on the potential impact of those posts on patients and or managed his caseload accordingly. They said to, from his keyboard, Dr. Cock has over the years been prepared from time to time to say online, what he thinks of various members of a profession and what he thinks of some of his colleagues. It's not to the point that arguably some other medical practitioners may silently agree with some or all of his views. Those medical practitioners have not exposed themselves in the way that Dr. Koch has. So they, uh, they determined that uh, his comments had the real potential to undermine public confidence. It had, they had had an adverse impact upon the profession and they suspended him. Interestingly, uh, there are posts from uh, various uh, Christian organizations describing um, that uh, this was an unfair and unreasonable uh, response in relation to uh, the practitioner. Now, uh, can, I, uh, can I say that um, uh, the, uh, I, I put up uh, a picture on, uh, on that overhead, that's of Dr. Ellis to whom we shall come now. That's Dr. Cobb. Dr. Ellis uh, applied similarly to review the decision of the medical board to take immediate action in public interest under section 156 against him too. Uh, Dr. Ellis were, is described as an integrative physician, a futurist and a peace worker. 75 years of age, he posted a significant number of posts and reposts about uh, vaccines, chemotherapy, COVID-19, and a variety of other topics. Again, uh, he had um, opinions about religious and other groups which were uh, offensive. Lots of anti-vax uh, material. Uh, Dr. Ellis's uh, uh, postings were described by VCAT 
as having been serious, even if his identity as a doctor was unknown to his readers. But the evidence indicated that his identity was known to a proportion of those who visited the sites, and uh, if not, it was ascertainable by them. So they found his statements to the effect that he tried to keep his identity as a registered practitioner secret to be unconvincing. They formed the reasonable belief that he posed a serious risk to persons. That's the first component in uh, section 1561A of the national law. And the risk that he'd now use social media inappropriately may be relatively low, but they found that he posed a serious risk to what he'd done by virtue of what he'd done. They said they had a reasonable belief that because of his conduct, he posed that risk in the way he practiced medicine and the misleading or otherwise unsatisfactory statements that he'd made are relevant in that context. They considered there was a real possibility that he'd engage in conduct that could be harmful to people by publishing in one way or another statements similar to what he published already. And uh, that led them uh, to conclude that he'd failed to display integrity and truthfulness uh, by posting material that was scientifically unsound, inflammatory, unreliable. He'd contradicted and countered public health campaigns and messaging from the, uh, the office of the chief medical officer and given legitimacy to false health related information. And by making those sorts of statements, they found that he'd failed to display the compassion which is required of medical practitioners. Again, referring back to good medical practice. They found he'd not been respectful to the beliefs and cultures of others. And that resulted in Dr. Ellis being suspended. There's been a uh, decision from the Irish High Court about a, uh, a medical practitioner who was, uh, uh, shall we say, um, COVID-19 um, uh, critical or mistrustful. And uh, he too has been uh, 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 suspended uh, from practice by reason of the espousal of such values and ideas at a time when, of course, the community needs to be able to rely upon, upon sound, objective, scientifically based uh, views and analyses from health practitioners. So what I've done is to identify to you two sides of what I think is a very interesting coin. I started off talking with you about doctors doing something that was inconceivable from the perspective of only a few years ago, suing their patients for unreasonable, offensive, defamatory online reviews and utterances. We've seen that a number of such cases have come before the courts, not confined to health practitioners, as you saw, uh, a lawyer's done the same, even a brothel has uh, done the same, endeavouring to protect its commercial reputation. But when health practitioners uh, assert their entitlement to accuracy in what is said about them, taking the step of attacking in a litigation sense, their own patients. Something very significant is happening in terms of the relationship between health practitioners and their patients. Each of the cases to which I have adverted has been reasonably straightforward in terms of the uh, inaccuracy and unreasonableness of the reviews and utterances. But nonetheless, what we have is a new form of involvement by the law in the balance in the relationship between health practitioners and their patients. And of course, part of that is that patients are being deprived of the capacity to hide behind the veil of anonymity, which often is extended by entities such as Google and rate your MD and others, which has precluded 
actions previously being brought, but now the door has been opened by the decision of Justice Murphy. The other side to that is health practitioners' use of social media. And what we've seen by the three decisions to which I have made reference is that there is a reciprocal expectation that health practitioners will be temperate and adherent to the values of their profession in how they comport themselves online. And part of, a fact, part of that is that the reality that a poster is a registered health practitioner is often quite ascertainable and wearing the, uh, the kind of, uh, of, of costume to which I, uh, I made reference in respect of uh, Dr. Lee, you'll remember the, uh, uh, the uh, attempt he made to arrogate to himself some anonymity is likely to be of little avail if there are other aspects to the publications which enable the individual to be associated with a profession and even potentially to be individually identifiable. And what we've seen then is that the uh, tribunals enforcing the health regulatory system in this country have been active in terms of attempting to protect and maintain the standing of the profession of medicine in particular in face of practitioners who have behaved in ways which are inconsistent with the self-professed values of the profession and also the expectations of members of the public. The point ultimately I make is that what we are seeing in this interesting intersection between the law and health professions is a recalibration in the era of uh, social media between health practitioners and their patients in which there is a requirement of uh, temperate, respectful and online aware behavior on the part of both health practitioners and their patients, endeavouring to set ground rules and to set a balancing, uh, which is fair, enabling expression of views which are genuinely held, but precluding enunciation of them in ways which are lacking in reasonableness, which are not factually based, or which are inflammatory or gratuitously offensive. We often talk about the law marching behind medicine and lagging significantly. I think this is an example of where the law is catching up and where there has been a constructive contribution by legal process in both respects, both by reference to this innovation of health practitioners being enabled to procure significant judgments against their patients in extreme circumstances and in the regulatory area and disciplinary decisions where health practitioners are being precluded from conducting themselves in ways which are incompatible with the values of their professions and with community expectations. I look forward to discussing these matters with you. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks very much, Ian. That was um, very enlightening and uh, talks to really power of social media and the internet, but also something, a topic that perhaps 20 years ago would have been uncharted territory uh, in the world that we live in today. It's uh, extremely uh, important and a topic and an area that's probably not going away. Um, again, thank you very much for that presentation. I'd like to now invite our discussants for responses. Um, we have Associate Professor Marie Bismarck and Dr. Rebecca McWhorter, who will um, add to our discussion with their perspectives on the topic. I'd like to first introduce uh, Associate Professor Marie Bismarck, who is a medical practitioner 
uh, Health Law Academic and Company Director. She heads the Law and Public Health Unit at the University of Melbourne, where her research explores the intersection between health, practitioner wellbeing, and patient safety. Her research has been published in leading peer review journals and has influenced regulatory policy in Australia and internationally. In addition to her academic role, Dr. Bismarck works as a psychiatry registrar with Northwestern Mental Health, and she also serves as a board member of the Royal Women's Hospital. Uh, GMHBA Health Insurance and Somerset Retirement Villages. Dr. Bismarck has previously completed a Harvard Fellowship at Harvard University and is the recipient of an NHMRC Investigator Grant. She holds degrees in law, medicine, public health, bioethics and psychiatry. In 2019, Dr. Bismarck was named as one of, us, of the Australian Financial Review's 100 Women of Influence. After uh, Associate Professor Marie Bismarck, we have Dr. Rebecca McWhirter, who is a senior lecturer in health, law and bioethics in the School of Medicine at Deakin. Her work uses empirical methods to address legal and ethical issues in health and aims to identify how the law can support public health. So if I hand over to you first, Marie, and then Rebecca, um, perhaps you can uh, right. go next. Please. Thanks, Nira. Thank you for the invitation to join you all and um, welcome to everyone at home. Um, Ian, thank you for that superb summary and really sort of a tour de force across all of these recent legal cases. It was incredibly helpful. And I think that your phrase around the reciprocity of responsibility is a phrase that we should all be taking home with us from today. Um, I guess what I've got is, is three key messages that I took away from your presentation um, and following on from that, three words of advice for health practitioners. So I think for me the three really strong messages were that the use of social media in the health professions is now ubiquitous, um, that this is a change that's here to stay, that we all need to accept that it's going to influence our professional practice we can no longer avoid the possibility that patients will be speaking about us online, but neither should we be avoiding the contribution that social media can make to our professional roles. Um, I'd like to draw people's attention to a wonderful article called Hippocrates Would Have Been on Twitter by Rebecca Sabo, which was published in the Medical Journal of Australia, and she really spoke about so much of what Hippocrates did was to share current medical knowledge. And she makes a really compelling case that if Hippocrates was practicing medicine today, he'd probably be right in there on Twitter um, sharing his, his medical knowledge and, and ethics with many of his followers. So I really commend that article to you. I think the second key message I took away from Ian's message is that patients have responsibilities and not only do patients have responsibilities, but the courts are increasingly willing to uphold those responsibilities, that we've seen a real shift in the willingness of the courts to actually hold patients to account for um, grossly defamatory statements. And I think that many health practitioners will take some comfort. I don't underestimate how stressful and time consuming and possibly expensive it would have been for some of those health practitioners um, to have followed that process all the way through to the end of those court hearings. It's not a position any of us would hope to find ourselves in. Um, but nevertheless, I think that some of those decisions will provide some comfort uh, for health practitioners. Of course, patient reviews are incredibly helpful for many health consumers, and we certainly don't want to dampen the ability for patients to be able to share and reflect on their experiences. Um, but where we are seeing posts that are, are both dishonest and also very damaging to people's professional reputations. There is now some accountability for that. And then the third point was that doctors have responsibilities too, coming back to this idea of reciprocity of responsibility. And certainly as a member of the medical profession, I find it very distressing when I see doctors like Dr. Lee um, making the kind of comments about women that he did online makes me really concerned for our profession. I worried a lot when I read those posts about whether 
Some women may be dissuaded from presenting to an emergency department to seek care if they felt that emergency department doctors may hold the views that Dr. Lee was espousing online. So I think that certainly most members of, of the medical profession do want to ensure um, that the information shared by health practitioners is truthful, is helpful um, as far as possible, that it's, that it's kind um, and that it's the kind of thing that will um, support trust in the profession rather than undermine patients' confidence in seeking medical care. So um, those are my, my three takeaway points from Ian's excellent presentation. In terms of the, the three words of advice for health practitioners that I took away from Ian's comments, I think the first was that we should all be reading those out for guidelines. Um, there's probably not a single health practitioner in Australia who might not be affected by the so use of social media. Um, I find the ARPRA guidelines um, to be helpful, they're readable, they're something that we should all be familiar with and that medical students and nursing students and al other allied health profession students should be familiar with those guidelines as well. I think the second um, piece of advice, and I guess this is more from my own personal experiences than necessarily from Ian's presentation, is that every doctor who's writing on social media should do so with the assumption that what they write might appear in the news the very next day. Um, and I can certainly think of, of three or four instances where I wrote something on Twitter and then the next day it did in fact appear in a news article. Um, I'm very mindful to, to write my tweets aware that they are for a wide public audience. It's always somewhat of a surprise when you see that they've been picked up by a journalist. Um, but I think that's a pretty helpful rule of thumb. I think somewhere that um, health practitioners can easily fall into trouble is when you think that you're posting within a private group. So if you feel that you're within a private Facebook page, um, and sadly, I've seen a, a number of situations, um, for example, within the, the medical mums group on Facebook, where doctors in good faith shared some quite personal and confidential information on what they thought was a closed and private Facebook group, only for it to make its way to their employer or to other members of the public, which was a very distressing experience for them. And I think it's, it's really wonderful when doctors can seek support and have the ability to have quite candid discussions. But I think ultimately we need to treat those, those private Facebook groups as if there is potential for that information to reach a wider public audience. And then really my last takeaway message is I think that um, a lot of what we heard from Ian today might make some health practitioners apprehensive about using social media. And I, I really want to remind people that there is tremendous good that can come from the use of social media. During the COVID pandemic, we've seen that um, groundbreaking research, um, incredible international collaborations, a lot of very strong um, professional support, encouragement from the community has come from social media. So I hope that people will not leave here um, feeling dissuaded from social media, but rather feeling as though they're better equipped to use it wisely and in a way that enhances both their practice, but also enhances the service that we provide to members of the public. That's all from me. Thanks, Nira. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, Anne? Do you have any comments for Marie or shall we move on to Rebecca? Uh, let, let's move on to Rebecca. Yep. I, I think the points were really helpfully made. Great. Beck? Thanks, Nira, and thank you, Ian, for a lovely talk. It's a pleasure to listen to you as always was particularly helpful because uh, I teach medical students uh, about health law and ethics. And um, in discussing social media, we haven't previously touched on what doctor, what action doctors can take against patients who might be defaming them. And so that's something that we can now add to our repertoire of things that we cover, which is really great. Thank you for that. When we do cover social media, the students get quite anxious, which is interesting um, because the cases, as you showed today, are not controversial. They're very extreme examples of behaviour um, and quite easy, I think, to find reprehensible. 
Um, and I think some of their anxiety comes from the competing messages that we send them. So on the one hand, we're all like, yay, so social media, uh, particularly med Twitter, as Marie uh, alluded to, can be a really beneficial thing for medical practitioners to engage in. Um, but then on the other hand, we talk about these cases and the need to be really careful. And I think some of them find it difficult to reconcile. And I think some of that comes from the blurring of the boundaries between the public and the private spheres and what they can say and what is them and what is their profession. Um, and when we're talking about it, uh, we often center in on what are the regulators trying to achieve here? And as Ian mentioned, that they're often giving the justification of undermining public confidence in the health system, which um, is an admirable goal, but I'm not sure if it is really what they're doing here. Um, I live in Hobart um, and I was taking my children to the emergency department during Dr. Lee's tenure here and um, hearing about, you know, he was advocating for really quite awful things. He was saying that some women deserve to be raped. Um, you know, it's horrific stuff that he was saying. And it's not, I haven't lost faith in the health system, but I lost a lot of faith in him specifically. <laughs> I did. I don't want to go and see Dr. Lee um, and I don't want my children anywhere near him. And so it's. I, I sort of wonder if maybe this social media regulation is a subset of the fit and proper person test, if really we're worried about who, who's a good person to be a medical practitioner, um, which is, it seems sort of intuitive, but obviously that's very difficult because the message that we would then be sending is that it's okay to hold whatever beliefs inside your own head, but as long as you don't make them public, that's that makes you a fit and proper person. And I'm not sure that that is what we mean. And so I think that there's a lot of things that the regulators are struggling with here in the boundaries of what is appropriate to regulate, what they can regulate and what the public expects from them. These things don't align in a really neat and helpful way, which I think is often the case with the law. Unfortunately, it's a messy business. Um, and it's not just with Lee that we see that. If we look at some of the recent debates about um, the role that medical practitioners can play in the vaccination debate. Um, the TGA initially came out saying that they couldn't participate in that debate publicly and that because that, or not, not to promote vaccination because that counted as advertising, which is prohibited, um, and then later recanted and said, actually, no, so long as you're balanced in what you say, um, that that won't be considered advertising. But they, be, they were very specific about what many medical practitioners could say and it had to have both benefits and risks and they couldn't talk about specific vaccines and and then that's very re restricted and so that's not really allowing people to be themselves on social media or to participate fully in the debate even on an area in which they have specific expertise but then there's a lot of risk to the health profession and to undermining public confidence both in allowing them to participate and in not allowing them because lots of doctors don't have the expertise in statistics and the and immunology that are required for that particular debate or in how to communicate scientific information to the public like that's a very specific skill um, that social scientists look into a lot not necessarily health practitioners and I guess I'd be really interested to hear what Ian thinks about that sort of regulatory and conceptual mess that that's facing everyone at the moment okay since so um, I might say something further about that then. Uh, it, it, you're, you're right, Rebecca, it's a, uh, it's a difficult kind of a, um, a, a balance, isn't it, uh, in terms of um, where one uh, identifies uh, the, um, the, the, the balance in a regulator ensuring that people are allowed to and enabled to and often encouraged to say what they want about contemporary issues and controversies, but not overstepping the line. And, and, and what, what we're seeing from the APRA uh, requirements and from the decisions from tribunals is an attempt to delineate a line, to, to say that practitioners cannot go to the point of being really offensive and 
uh, uncaring, uh, lacking all compassion, bringing the profession into disrepute by bizarre and offensive uh, tweets or communications on social media. And, and uh, the contribution from the, uh, the Irish case, and uh, that's discussed in the bottom of those readings, and the Hippocrates one is referred to in the top of them, is a, is a fascinating one where our uh, system has said this is a time of particular sensitivity and there are things which are just not uh, uh, acceptable at all and which if they are undertaken will be incompatible with what the community wants of health practitioners. Something upon which people can differ and it's very important that uh, social media, sorry, that, that regulators not go too far and start becoming ethical policemen. Uh, they've got a job to do in terms of uh, determining whether practitioners have engaged in professional misconduct uh, and the tribunals have a decision to make in terms of what the consequences of that should be. Uh, they are not easy balances. Perhaps the cases that we've looked at have been at extreme ends and the hard ones will come in cases which are troubling but not as extreme as the ones which we've talked about thus far. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience, Ian. Um, some of them are questions, some of them are broader statements. Um, one from Natalie Hendry on Twitter. Super interesting listening to this, given some of the discussions in the Australian wellness spaces at the moment, prompted by a practitioner's current IPO. Meeting regulations is more complicated as people move further away from public health and medicine to other industries. Any comments? There are a number of complexities, and, uh, and uh, I, I think Marie identified one of those, and, and we've spoken a little bit about when a person is a, a health practitioner and when they're not, and they, the answer is pretty much they are virtually all of the time because it's so often going to be possible to identify a person as a practitioner. So when a person is minded to ventilate in different spaces, online or otherwise, uh, there is a risk that uh, what they do or say will uh, uh, reflect upon others. Practitioners, of course, like every, like all of us, uh, exist in different spheres, uh, different contexts. So it might be on uh, on uh, medical mums or bar mums, or uh, it might be on a, an interest group of some kind. GPs down under is another example, and and one sees on those areas of of social media people really relating experiences and cases uh, and, and talking of their own feelings and experiences. The last thing one would want the law to do is to be inhibiting that. Um, but there are lines, of course, that just people ought not to, uh, to, to cross. And uh, that, uh, that's going to cross over what people do professionally uh, across to what they do in other domains and even what they do some of the time socially. But it'd be interesting to hear what both Marie and uh, Rebecca say about that. Either or, Marie? I think it's difficult and I think we're still learning as we go. As, as Ian said, this has been a really profound change um, in the visibility of health professionals to the community. I think that many health practitioners do it exceptionally well, that there's huge public health benefit to the information that they're sharing on social media. I think sometimes when health professionals um, are quite vulnerable online, it can be tremendous helpful in terms of increasing um, the diversity of, of health professionals that are visible to people who might be thinking about entering medicine or nursing or one of the allied health professionals. I think there are some health professionals with lived experience of, of mental illness um, who've done a really wonderful job of, of communicating that um, people from different uh, ethnic and cultural backgrounds who've shared some of the challenges that they've had. And so I think sometimes those personal disclosures can actually be very beneficial 
for the profession as long as it's being done in a, in a thoughtful and considered way. Beck? I would absolutely agree with that. And I benefit from those wonderful med Twitter folk all the time and their vulnerabilities and their useful discussions. Um, it seems like people pick it up as they go along a lot of the time by sort of watching what other people do and sort of adapting to those sort of social norms, I guess, as we do in all aspects of our lives. Um, in some ways, it seems slightly unfair that doctors and lawyers are held to this much more stringent standard than other people, um, including, say, university lecturers and things. Um, but obviously there are benefits to their positions as well. But I guess I feel like maybe it's not an informed choice, even if it's a fair bargain, you know, when you're 17 and choosing what degree to do at uni. Um, you maybe are not thinking about your responsibilities on social media in the future. Um, so it's something that's sort of thrust upon you later. Um, but I think that it's really important that people, I don't know, maybe if those standards were more broadly applied and that everyone calmed down slightly on the cancelling as well, and if everyone was kinder and more respectful, that the world would in general be a better place. Yeah. And, and Mary, the one other thing that I wanted to say is just to have the humility to recognise and apologise when you get it wrong. You know, there's a lot of nuance that can be lost in a tweet. And in my experience, you know, the social community, social media community is generally pretty forgiving. If people will genuinely say, you know, either that wasn't my intent when I posted it, but I appreciate it could have come across in that way and I apologise, or otherwise to say, look, you know, there were implications of, of what I said that I didn't fully understand at the time and thank you for drawing to my attention um, how hurtful those comments could have been for a particular group. And again, that, that willingness um, to have that humility and to be willing to learn and to when, recognise when you haven't got things quite right. It's open disclosure, but for social media, it has the same effect. People are much less likely to get further across. It, it's um, we two need more to, questions. Karen, it, It's certainly something we need to keep thinking and talking about. Heather Edwards has made the point that um, yeah. it, it needs to be part of education programs. So, uh, here's an example of, of the complexity of it. We, we often talk about the need for health practitioners to be cautious about personal revelations for fear of that uh, prompting uh, boundary blurring and misunderstandings by patients. But Marie's just made the point that some measure of personal disclosure can be constructive, both in a therapeutic clinical sense and also uh, more broadly. Uh, where are the limits of that in terms of what goes on social media? Uh, there, there aren't easy answers to this. We, one can see the, uh, that there are things which practitioners ought not to do, but when one comes back to areas which are not clearly identifying of a patient, but which are personally self-revelatory, it's important for practitioners to think carefully about what they're doing, because it might be that a particular patient who is in a vulnerable position in their life, might read it, might apply it to themselves, it might impact upon the relationship which they have with their practitioner. So it's all illustrative of the fact that one's digital health uh, footprint as a health practitioner can radiate out in ways which one would not immediately contemplate. In addition, even with closed groups, and GPs down under is an example, uh, it might be that patients are not able to have access to that, but a friend of theirs can and talks about it. And so what's personally disclosed in that forum all of a sudden becomes known more broadly and people think that it might be referring to them when in fact that wasn't the intention. These are things really worthy of thoughtful, reflective uh, discussion, I think, because they're hard. And then I think there's an issue around um, boundaries as to how much we discuss. And Caroline Tui has um, posted a question on YouTube. And Caroline asked um, whether the panellists, each of you, um, have an opinion on um, uh, 
do you think there is a way in which doctors can express their personal views, for instance, your religious views, um, that are in line in, in a way that won't breach the board's code of conduct? Or is there parameters in which you're allowed to or not allowed to express your personal views? Um, and, and, and what are the, I guess, the ramifications of doing so? Why don't I let uh, Marie and Rebecca start with that and then I'll have something to say afterwards. Um, so I think, again, that's an area where I've seen this done really beautifully on social media. You know, I find it really joyful when health practitioners from different religious and ethnic backgrounds, for example, share um, celebrations or um, religious days that are of particular significance to them. They might you know, be sharing a, a meal that they've had with a family or or a celebration from, from the Jewish Jewish faith or from their Muslim background. And it's it's been a really joyful and appropriate thing for me. Um, I think, you know, where the concern might begin to arise is if you're implying that those religious beliefs um, may impact on the way that you provide patient care. So, for example, you could imagine that if you were a um, a pharmacist with very strong Catholic beliefs and you were speaking very strongly online on your views about uh, premarital sex or about emergency contraception, I could see that you could certainly be crossing a line there that might come to the attention of the board. Absolutely. I concur with everything that Marie just said. It's just thinking about the implications of what you're saying for patient care and patient trust and whether that's likely to affect whether they feel comfortable in coming to see you and in getting the care that they deserve and have a right to access. Um, and that will depend on where you are. If you're in a huge city with lots and lots of people, then maybe people knowing that of your personal religious beliefs is very valuable to people so that they can make it an informed choice about whether you're the best practitioner for them. If you're in a re in regional Tasmania, in an area where you're the only person for hundreds of kilometres, then maybe you need to think about how best to serve your patients. Yeah. A lot of it's about um, adhering to those core values of being a health practitioner and trustworthiness and respectfulness and compassion. And if a person does that, that ought to inhibit the excesses that we've seen, for instance, in each one of the, uh, the, the cases to which I made reference, Lee, Cock and Ellis, because those were just inherently uh, disrespectful and uh, distressing for sectors of the community and uh, a small amount of empathy and reflection would have prompted each one of those practitioners uh, mm. to have tempered their words mm. uh, uh, and alerted them to the fact that what they were thinking or feeling was likely to be experienced as highly distressing. Uh, I think my colleague Jeff has a question, Jeff. Thanks, Nira, and thanks everyone for this really, really interesting and thoughtful discussion. I think Beck may have answered part of this question, but my question is, can the public or private health practitioners in Australia advertise via social media? And if not, how, what's, what's, um, what's happened overseas that's, um, when that's allowed um, to be, uh, to, when that advertising is allowed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. And it was so interesting when I told my um, daughter last night that I was giving this, um, contributing to this panel today, the first thing she said was, oh, mum, could you please talk about the cosmetic surgeons who offer free cosmetic injectables to 16-year-old girls on Instagram? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, really, honey? And she said, yeah, you know, here are, you know, these 16-year-old girls who I follow on Instagram who are influencers. And here are copies of messages that they've received from cosmetic surgeons wanting um, to partner with them as brand partners and offering these 16-year-old girls free cosmetic injectables. And she was like, Mum, could you please, could you please mention that? So I, I will mention that. And I, I think certainly in Australia, I, I like to think um, that the board would consider that that was not an acceptable form of, of advertising. 
Um, my sense in Australia is that you're allowed to provide factual descriptions of the services that you offer, that you're certainly able to have a, a web presence and to indicate what services you can provide to patients. There are restrictions on the use of um, patient testimonials um, and you can't be making unfounded claims. Um, but as long as, as the information that you're providing is factual um, and will assist patients to recognise that you're providing a service that may be of use to them, um, you are able to advertise to that extent. Mm -hmm. It's a, another example of that blurring of public and private, I think, that is so difficult to find a clear line um, because there are definitely practitioners on all forms of social media who have just through being themselves but active on social media have developed what is essentially a brand that is then vehemently supported by people in the comments and stuff which would you know some of the things that get said would go beyond the sort of testimonial limits at, but people use that to make their decisions but it's so difficult to categorize exactly what that is because it's evolving all the time and we aren't it doesn't fit into existing regulatory categories um that it's very hard to say until it comes before a board i guess mm -hmm. yes the um the tga and uh, the boards are defining advertising very broadly as, as any kind of communication which is effectively entrepreneurial or self-promoting. And it does require that it be evidence-based and that it not be a false, misleading or deceptive in those sorts of consumer protection sensors. So those are ways, in addition to the preclusion on testimonials and before and after pictures that inhibit uh, the advertising that can be engaged in by practitioners. But at a practical sense, and Carolyn Tui would be very conscious of this, uh, it, it, these are difficult lines where some practitioners really do push the boundaries as means of self-promotion in what is a highly competitive business environment. It might be the, uh, the practice of medicine or dentistry or Chinese medicine or chiropractic, but practitioners are competing one against another in, an, in a world where there's only room for a certain number of people and where there are pecuniary advantages for those who become individuals of higher profile than others. And so uh, the uh, legitimacy of advertising via social media and other mechanisms is a, an important uh, area of tension uh, in, uh, in regulation of health practitioners right now. It, it's generally dealt with in a soft way by uh, the regulators communicating with the individuals concerned and suggesting that they're perhaps going a little bit too far uh, but if a practitioner uh, persists in it, then, of course, uh, things become uh, a, a bit more contentious and matters can make their way to the disciplinary tribunals. Um, I have a question from my colleague, Tim, Tim Neal. And Tim has um, said that and so we've, spent a, a, we've spent a fair amount of time focusing on the second part of your presentation. And Tim's question relates to the first part of your presentation. And um, Tim has asked whether uh, health practitioners are quite concerned about their reputational damage uh, online in relation to uh, sort of Google reviews, et cetera, and whether health practitioners actually do Google themselves um, and what forms of reputation, such as Google reviews or you know, doc M MD review or whatever they might use. And are they watching, are they actively watching and seeking um, to, to look at these reviews in terms of, you know, their concerns about their own reputation? Uh, these forms of review are becoming more and more commercially important in the kind of context that we were just discussing. Um, medicine, dentistry, all of the health professions are, are businesses. Uh, they, uh, uh, people have uh, a, uh, a value in terms of their perceptions uh, on the internet. And so, yes, many practitioners do look at what's being said about them. 
because they know that patients are looking about them uh, at them. There have been some uh, surveys recently about the numbers of patients who look at different sites before they go to see a person to whom they're referred or when they're considering whether someone should be their doctor or their dentist, whether it be in circumstances of emergency or referral. And what is taking place as part of this recalibration of the health practitioner patient relationship, where a considerable percentage of patients research uh, their practitioner. Uh, and so what is being said matters uh, in the sense of, uh, of uh, business reputation. So uh, 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 if something is said that is unwarranted and uh, absolutely unreasonable, it does have an impact on the health practitioner. And what we can see from some of those cases to which I made reference is that the practitioners are very aware of it and uh, are conscious that um, their reputation can ebb and flow depending on those reviews coming in. And this is a, a phenomenon, it seems to me, that is going to gather more momentum with the passage of time. Yeah. Um, Mira, my uh, PhD student, Dr. Owen Bradfield, is, is doing an exceptional PhD at the moment where he's looking at the health and well-being impacts of medico-legal events on doctors. And what we do know is that having a complaint made about you as a health practitioner can have really profound consequences. I think that on the whole, health professionals um, take a lot of pride and a lot of their personal identity is connected um, with providing good care for their patients. And that when critical comments are made, whether it's by way of a formal complaint or, or online, many health professionals will really take that to heart. Um, and Owen's been doing some great work looking to see in the period after a complaint has been made, how that impacts on a health professional's health and, and well-being um, and I think we really need to be very mindful of the way that we support each other within the profession um, and that if there are effective ways of dealing with these kind of stressors or even just acknowledging for our colleagues what a difficult experience it can be, um, providing the kind of guidance that Ian has spoken about that if, if you've really stepped out of line and have had a warning about how you could um, reflect on that and, and incorporate those suggestions into your practice. I really think that as time goes on, that part of our professional peer review um, and support of our colleagues is going to need to have some greater focus on how we support our colleagues in this space. Absolutely, it sounds like a very valuable PhD. Um, final question we have, I know Jeff had another one, but sorry, Jeff, you've had your one question. Um, final question from Ruth. D'Souza on YouTube, uh, thanks for an important conversation. I think social media brings to the four people's beliefs that they've always been there, but less visible, as Marie said. I'm wondering about how we as health professionals can balance the being, uh, balance being ourselves with being careful. I almost wonder if we need a filter service. <laughs> I think often the best filter is to give oneself a little time to reflect on whether if one expostulates as one is tempted to, it, it's going to have a problematic repercussions for patients, for one's profession, or even, even for oneself. So that, uh, that rule about sleeping on it uh, or talking mm. to a colleague whom one trusts, um, it makes an awful lot of sense because often what happens is that there's an impulsive, um, uh, ventilation um, late at night, early in, in the early hours, perhaps under the influence of more than one glass of wine. And things are said which uh, really ought not to be. So uh, for, for the, the sensible, uh, well-intentioned practitioner, giving oneself some time or if in doubt speaking to someone whom one trusts is, is a, a sensible kind of recourse. But uh, uh, Marie and Rebecca, what do you think? Plus one to everything you just said, that, that sums it up. And I mean, if you really aren't sure or you can't speak to someone, just don't. don't. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to re regret not speaking out, I don't think. Or well, draft the email and then delete it. You've got it out of your system. <laughs> I think that brings us to the end on a final note for um, our 
uh, audience. Um, it's, if you enjoyed the seminar as much as we did, um, please consider signing up to uh, the Science and Society Network newsletter. It's scienceandsocietynetwork.deacon.edu.au. Um, that brings us to the end of what has been a really interesting, insightful, um, excellent seminar to kick off a Monday in COVID for us Victorians and those of you in New South Wales. Um, on a really interesting topic. I'd like to thank our presenter, Professor Ian Freckleton, and our two uh, discussants, uh, Associate Professor Marie Bismarck and Dr. Rebecca McWhirta. Thank you all for giving up time on Monday morning. Um, it's been an exceptionally um, brilliant seminar. I've really enjoyed it, as I'm sure our audience um, have too. So thank you all very much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, Nira brings us to the end.